this your baby of the last three years? Is that how long this has been in the making? Yeah, it was pretty much uh, about three years of, of development time for this one, yeah. Um, someone said to me that your, your brief was a pretty straightforward one. Make the fastest bike that there's, there's ever been. So, yeah, no well, pressure then. No, no pressure. Um, but at the same time, we said, you know, it, it's a bold statement, but, you know, if you're going to do a job, you've got you've to have big aims and, and why not, you know, try and take a British technology up and mix it with, the, you know, the best in the world. Yeah, and obviously the fastest bike, I mean, it partly depends who's sitting on it, clearly. But um, in terms of the, the aerodynamics, in terms of the development, so you had pretty much a, a clean slate on this. Um, what, can you, what can you do? What changes have you been able to come up with in terms of trying to find improvements um, and innovation? Because actually there has to be only so much that you can do because you've got to work within certain parameters, haven't you? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, obviously, everyone knows aerodynamic shapes. is not too much you can do on that. Um, and obviously, we have dissected every single tube section, first in CFD and then um, rapid prototyping before moving on to actual products in the wind tunnel. Um, the key, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of key elements to this bike, but one of the key factors to the bike was the handlebar. All of our testing has been done um, with Ryan. Is that the, the, the blue handlebar cockpit area there we're looking at primarily? Yeah. Yep, that's correct. Um, we did a lot of testing, obviously, as anyone would do, frame and fork initially, um, using, uh, I'll stand up for a second, uh, for, for the first time, this is our level five integrated handlebar, which uses um, a pretty traditional truncated aerofoil style handlebar, which obviously a lot of other brands use. Um, and we had this bike and we tested it, it tested without rider very fast. And as soon as you put a rider on it, we lost a lot of that, um, those gains. And, and we started to look at the handlebar and think, oh, why have we lost those gains? Um, and basically, something that's so aero, like that, that section there, the wind goes straight over and hits the rider. And obviously, the rider takes up around 80% of uh, you know, what actually hits the wind. And so we were like, what can we do? To, to improve this and the handlebar, the, at least the top section of the handlebar, is the one part that regardless of whatever degree of yaw you are, so whatever wind angle you're at, you're always sitting behind the handlebar. You know, we've seen um, technology move on, especially in track bikes recently where we've moved fork blades outwards to sit in front of the rider's legs um, to create a wake around the rider's legs, whereas the handlebar, obviously the, the top of the handlebar is always in front of the rider so like, what can we do to effectively create a wake generator? And you've, you've ditched tape by the looks of it. Yeah, I mean, as soon as we started looking at the handlebar, there were so many things we could look into. And the first thing that came to mind was you've got this kind of age old uh, technology, which is a metal clamp, which basically attaches the, the brake lever to the handlebar. And in using that mechanism, you obviously, you know, you, you fix a, a handlebar by putting it along, along the drop section, which means the drop section is always a fixed diameter and, and, and it's got to be circular. So we thought, well, why? So, you know, it's a bit of out of the box thinking. So we decided to, um, we invented this um, direct mount brake lever, which mounts from the back. And, and from that, we've managed to kind of eliminate the standard drop section so we can completely dictate the, the, the form of the drops for both ergonomic and aerodynamic gains, which obviously allowed us to basically do whatever we want. The kind of thing you'd maybe see on a track bar where you've got no need to uh, put brake levers on. So that was the first part. And the second part, as you can, a lot of you can probably see, the bulges underneath, they're effectively wake generators. And the way they work is similar to the, the fork in line with, with the legs. They basically generate wake around the rider so that you're bypassing your knees. And you mentioned about the fact that a lot of this is um it's only really valid when you've got a rider sitting on the top of the bike. Um, that rider was you in many cases in the wind tunnel, am I right? Yeah, well, initially to start with the CFD, which is the computational fluid dynamics, so basically digital. I was scanned on the bike, so a digital version of me, um, and to make sure that all the data runs with a kind of a true comparison, um, it made sense to use me in the wind tunnel. But when we're talking about these wake generators, obviously you're talking about something fixed on a bike, but then the area you're trying to kind of create a wake around are your legs, which are moving. You've got different, different shapes, different sizes, different height riders. 
Um, so obviously to make sure that these, the testing was true testing and, and you know, real comparison, we had to use different, well, different subjects basically. We used a fixed mannequin, which is brilliant in the wind tunnel because it, it doesn't move and gives you a realistic, gives you static numbers, but obviously the mannequin doesn't pedal, which is where um, we had the help from the team. We had Josh Loudon, who's the women's world hour record holder. Um, we had her in the, in the wind tunnel with us and that, that, you know, that was great. And that's a key development, isn't it, really? Because so often you see in the past um, companies in, in developing new products would do so with them, for argument's sake, with the men's pro trade team. Um, and then once that was all sorted, they'd, they'd maybe just hand over some of the bikes to the women's team and say, well, well, there you go. But you as a company have very much had this team that you are already involved in, in mind, in the design of this. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, obviously, we, we sponsor both the women's team and the River World Tour men's pro team, but we didn't have the men in, in the wind tunnel, but, you know, we did have, we did have just in the wind tunnel with us. And it was, it was key to see the difference between, you know, we used three very distinctive body shapes and sizes um, just to make sure that the, all the data was stacking up and, you know, we hadn't just invented something that, <laughs> you know, wasn't actually uh, working. Um. Eileen and Alice, is this, is this a bike that you've ridden yet? Or are you, is, this, is this to come? Is this something to look forward to for the new season? Well, I'm really looking forward to it, but I haven't had the pleasure to ride it yet. But um, all I've heard, uh, because I know some people that have ridden it, is, is only really good. So, yeah, for now, it's um, for the next season, it's something to, something to look forward to. Yeah. And Alice, do you think with, with something like this, um, because inevitably one imagines the, the gains or otherwise, I don't want to use the M word, but you know, they, they're not going to be that big, are they, in real terms? They can't be by its very nature, because we're already talking about pushing the boundaries and in designers before now. Um, can, can you feel a difference? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you, you can really feel the difference, but only not in not only in the aerodynamic part of it, but for us, it's really important how the bike handles and, and how it feels on the road. So like the testing in this wind tunnel that's being done is like uh, really good for us for a baseline, but the main thing for us is that it handles well. And what I've noticed this year on the Ribble is that it handles very, very well, uh, which was, yeah, because we didn't know the brand that well, it was really not, yeah, for me it was surprising, but really pleasant surprise that it was, <coughs> Yeah, it was such a such a nice bike to handle and also to uh, to race on because that's what we're doing and that's what it, it needs to be made for. Yeah. Do you feel the same way, or sometimes do you, do you need somebody like Jamie to, to put the numbers in front of him and say this this bike will do this? This is these are the facts, or I can you just feel it? Yeah. No, I think. I mean, first off, the bike needs to be comfortable, and if it's comfortable, it's fast. So as soon as I got on the bike, I think we all got ours in about like February, March time, and uh, like straight away, they were so comfortable, so solid. And just like the fact that they're comfortable and solid, just you f they feel fast and, and uh, yeah, like that anyway. So I'm sure, uh, and I think once, you, once they feel comfortable and then you get told the facts, then you start believing them. Cause like, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just a, it's a pleasure to ride. And I've, it's been a pleasure to ride all year. Is there, to is, is there an element of that, Tom, if they believe it, then it is? Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I think um, a lot of a lot of the process is in the mind for the riders. Um, they have to also believe in the product they're riding. Um, that also comes across in an authentic way with the marketing side and uh, and that part of it. Um, and I feel like we've made huge progress um, having Ribble as a partner. With it, that we're really their priority. Um, we we've been pushing for years to be part of the R and D side. Um, so yeah, having, having Ribble as a partner has, has been really beneficial uh, for us as a team. Yeah, we'll talk about the, the team and where you are and, and where you're all going shortly. I just want to talk about the bike for a little bit longer because that's the, sort of like the star of the show up here tonight. Um, Jamie, it, was, it sounded great that you were given this, this opportunity to explore and try to find the most aerodynamic bike you possibly could and to try to, to find these gains from somewhere. How did you find it? I, I imagine very time consuming, being as it took three years, but is it frustrating? Because there must be so many rules and regulations that are in place. It's like a box which you have to stay within in terms of what the UCI will allow you to do. Do you feel that there are a lot of things you could do if the rules are slightly different or not? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if you go back to the to the wall with um, fitting inside the UCI boxes, you, you are limited. I mean, obviously, we're all in the same box. Um, but it kind of, I suppose, it does take away from where you could go. I mean, we've only got to look back, you know, going back to Boardman's 92 Barcelona Lotus bike. If you if you look at that, it almost looks kind of more modern in yeah. a way than, than than a traditional. It's, it's iconic, isn't it? Yeah. That we've not got well, you know, we've gone forwards, but we've also gone backwards. You know, if obviously if there were no UCI boxes and having to keep to a, effectively a main triangle formation, then you know we could go pretty much anywhere. Um, it's a different looking bike to when you were a, a professional, isn't it? Just a bit. <laughs> I mean, I, that was not that long ago, um, but long enough. I mean, to, I mean, how much has it changed? You know, even in the last decade, which of course is. A shorter time. Yeah, I mean, I mean, have there been major, have been major advances, or is it is it materials? What's been the biggest difference? I think, yeah, going back to your <laughs> the word you were trying to avoid, it it, it, <laughs> it has it has been. You're not talking about the M word. No, it has been a decade of marginal gains. <laughs> yeah. um, but but it, you know, it's true. I mean, obviously, disc brakes are the kind of. They're not really a, a massively performance-changing um, factor, but obviously, you know, obviously they are better braking, but they're not necessarily going to make you go faster. It is. It has been a, a kind of a collaboration of lots of small parts together, and that's from you know from clothing, skin suits, soft goods, all the way through to bikes themselves. Do you, did your professional career that help you now in the job that you've got, or do you, are you are you effectively riding a completely different machine? Yeah, I mean, it's completely different to, to when I was racing. Um, it's more, I'd say there is one thing that's changed a lot. There's, there's a lot more, I wouldn't say the input from riders, but I think riders demand more. I think, it, you know, going back when I was racing, even like in the big teams, a bike, you wouldn't well, say a bike was a bike, but there's your bike, you get on, you ride it. You didn't have much say in or any say in um, any equipment or changes that weren't standard from from the team whereas now you know riders are demanding more because obviously you know we, we, we we've seen with originally team sky pushing the limits on so many things that if everyone else wants to keep up then you know you've got to look into everything and if if the riders literally you know it's the rider at the end of the day that's making these massive sacrifices you know training in the rain the snow 40 degrees whatever it is and if if you know you're on some equipment that you know, you know for a fact that those wheels or that frame is, you know, five watts slower than something else. You're like, you're training like mad to find those extra five watts, and then you're giving it away because you haven't got the right equipment. You know, you can understand why riders would be, you know, a bit upset by that. Um, we'll talk to the riders in, in just a moment again. You mentioned the fact that ultimately it comes down to who's riding the bikes and the form that they've got. Um, we've got a, an, another year has been and gone, another season has been and gone, Tom. What's it, how do you? Reflect on it for your for your team and the way your your riders perform during the year. I, I think we've had an amazing year. Um, our sixth one, probably my favourite. Last year was a pretty pretty much a no show with COVID. We had some pretty harsh restrictions on the UK and with travel, and that affected quite a quite a, the team quite significantly. Um, our budget issues previous to that have been well documented, and we've been quite open to that. So. This year has been like a new beginning, really, for the team, and um, I think we've grabbed the opportunity with um, both hands. And I think not only from a, a performance side, but off the bike as well, with with staff and culture, and we've really taken a, a step forward. And um, with the likes of Ribble and Nicole signed up for the next couple of years, there's that stability there going on to next year that we've we've really been after. Um, and um, yeah, the future's bright, and um, yeah, we're really looking forward to, to taking this year on. Is there one ride or one race that really stands out for you from this past season? Uh, and it's been quite a long season. I think at the moment we're obviously looking back. Um, a, a lot of what we, we talk about now is what we can do better, um, which is kind of where we're at. We, we really want to be one of the best in the world, and that's quite a big thing to say, and we're quite... Um, we're in that process, but um, but you're you're stepping in that direction, aren't you? Incrementally. Yeah, in in terms of facts and rankings, we we went from 33rd to 16th in the world this year. Um, we want to be in the top 10, and with that comes with world tour rank, world tour licenses, and that's 
um, quite far away, to be honest with you, but it's, um, we're in that process. Um, but in terms of yeah, your original question, I would, I would say Mayo's ride in, in Roubaix was yeah, iconic, first ever women's Roubaix. Um, that was pretty special to watch, um, of what we got to watch of it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, there's so many, Joss, um, our record, women's tour, we had four, again, Mayo, four top tens, Joss was 10th overall. Um, I also enjoy, yeah, like, likes of Alice and their, the young ones' performances on, on their first world tour race. And, yeah, there's so much we can take from this year and, and be really proud of it. Yeah, you've got these, these two signed up for another couple of years, um, so that's all sorted. But you've made some signings as well already for next season. How are things shaping up? Uh, yeah, I think we've um, significantly improved the team. Um, of uh, French rider Gladys Verholst, um, new road captain um, Jesse van den Bolkum. One thing I think that um, was quite important for us was to sign a couple of new uh, young British riders that um, maybe don't necessarily fit into the British cycling track system. Um, so we've done, with, done that with um, a London girl called Flora Perkins who's stepping up to senior level for the first time and, and Elle King who's from Wales and she's been senior this year but didn't race so much because of, of COVID but um, they both work with BC on the side but we, we help their road in, uh, ambitions so yeah we're really excited for the team we have next year. You, you mentioned the ride of uh, Maolene in, in Paris-Roubaix I've got to ask you about that um, there's a bit of a backstory to that one isn't there I mean you did well to get to the start line I think. Yeah it was a bit of a well it, I've from the beginning, I knew like Roubaix would be my main goal for the season, and first because um, it got delayed very late. So in first it was Spring Classics and Roubaix, uh, but then it got delayed to the end of the season. Which actually, in thinking back, it would have been it's better for me to have it later in the year just to get more into it. Um, and also the Spring Classics were a bit a lot this year, so we uh, we got a bit tired at the end. But yeah, then um, I was prepping really well, did a lot of recons, and I did Tour of Norway, which um, I left at 50k. <laughs> and, and Tour um, of Norway was how long before Paris-Roubaix? A few weeks? Five weeks. Five, five weeks. weeks, yeah. Um, and in, after 50k, massive crash, I went down and I actually thought I was fine, uh, but I saw my bike and my saddle was like clean off. So it was a hard crash. Um, I think I was like, oh, I can't stand up, but someone helped me up, I was fine. And, uh, and I got a new bike and I tried to pedal and I, then I found out I couldn't bend my knee. Um, so yeah, that was really instantly, actually I thought of Roubaix and thought, oh no, okay, this is the season done. I cannot bend my knee, I cannot ride my bike. Um, went that off. Bit, a bit of a hands on your head moment there, Tom? Uh, yeah, I don't get to go often to all the races, but I was there and we pulled her up off the floor and. She was adamant she can continue, but it didn't look great. But we had a nice night in Oslo uh, Hospital, didn't we? And um, we got you home in a, in a knee brace and kind of uh, had to assess the situation when, when we knew more. But um, yeah, testament to Mayo. She, she did all the recovery. She's a physio, so she did all the recovery. She was her own patient almost, so um, she was really dedicated. So, and and, and you, were in a, you were in a race against time. If, I mean, in your mind, were you thinking, I am, I will be on the start line come what may, or did you not know? Yes, yes, but it was also, I, I had planned my prep for Roubaix very carefully, and uh, I planned a, a training camp in Spain the week after. So they told me I couldn't ride my bike until I was cleared from the doctor, and that took a week, so I couldn't ride my bike for a week. And I was getting anxious because I was like, okay, and I got cleared a few days before I was supposed to leave on training camp. Um, so just starting off really easy on the turbo, trying to put some pressure on and it felt really bad. I was like, I'm never gonna make it to training camp and then I would be in Spain doing nothing. Um, but also due to like with the team and everyone like giving me advice, supporting me and, and trying to like also the medical staff, we made a plan and I made it to training camp and actually day by day I felt better and better and actually had my best training week ever there and, and my recovery went way quicker than we expected it to be um, which gave me I think an extra boost that I could just push myself a bit further than normal. What about the event itself? I mean, there was so much hype about it wasn't there? I mean it from the outside it, it just looked like an epic weekend from start to finish. Um, how was the experience for you and being part of that did it match your your expectations? Yeah, it actually did. Um, but the funny thing was, I think the whole peloton like freaked out 
um, because of Roubaix. Everyone didn't know what to expect, especially because it was going to be wet. Uh, we didn't have the same weather as the guys on the day after, but it was actually, I think for us, it was a bit more tricky because some patches were really like slippery and wet and some patches were kind of dry. So you never ex know what to expect. And then um, because I prepped so well, I knew the whole course like by heart, I could like tell you all the, <laughs> all the all the cobblestones and and how long they would be and where the tricky parts would be and that gave me a bit of like calm and and, and yeah ease actually and and by the start line I was just really excited and not feeling the stress that I saw other girls have and taping in their hands like all the way around and I'm like okay well <laughs> I don't know if that's gonna help but um, yeah it, it just felt really nice and easy and calm actually which is unlike me in, at most races. So, yeah, it was, it was nice for a change, yeah. That was a knowing chuckle there from Tom. I, I noted that. Um, Alice, you've got to the end of your first season in the, in the Women's World Tour Peloton. You, you've survived. Is that, is that how it feels? You've, you've hung in there and come through it? Yeah, I guess survived is, like, um, quite a good way to explain it. Um, I definitely had a bit of a beating to start off with. Like, it was a big step up. You know, the level's super high, and it gets higher every year, I think. Um, so at the start of the year, yeah, I was just hanging, hanging on to the bunch, you know. Because I was looking at some around. of the... I mean, you, you rode Flèche Wallonne, Liège-Bastogne, yeah. you rode La Course this year. I mean, that's, yeah, like, that's being thrown in at the deep end, isn't it? Definitely thrown in the deep end, yeah. And um, I don't think I'd have done it any other way, really. I'd rather learn, learn as much as I can as quick as I can. And I did have to learn quick, because... Um, I went straight from, I mean, there wasn't any racing last year, so I went from like being a first year junior, like not really having much experience to, yeah, racing like Flesh Wallone and Liège, so you definitely have to, have to learn quick and learn from your mistakes as well, which is uh, what I try to do. Like, and, and will it be racing. nice to, to go to races where, where announcers and commentators aren't saying that you're the youngest person in the race? Yeah, like, after, like on the team presentation, each time they'd say, oh, is Alice Towers the youngest one in the race? But next year, I think, uh, well, yeah, they'll, they'll be ones younger, so. Yeah. Just turned 19, so they won't be saying um, I'm 18 anymore. <laughs> but Mayo, she's got some staying power, hasn't she? She surprised you more than once by, by still being in there? Yeah, yeah, I actually, actually didn't know her that well, also because she came from the juniors, and um, when she joined us in the spring, um, I was actually really, really surprised because she told me she didn't have like too many years of experience and it was like and this race we started in was Utinga which was Kobol's climbs and, and everything um, and actually she was one of the few girls that stayed with me in the first group and in and, and the final she came up to me and said like oh what, what do you want me to do I'm still here I was like oh sorry I didn't expect you to be still be here but yeah it was, a, it was really good and she really surprised me and she kept surprising me since yeah. yeah we mentioned I mean it was such a it's inevitably going to be such a big learning curve um, and you don't know how you're going to fare until you're put in that situation. But I guess you must have had some pleasant surprises along the way, like, like riding stage races like the Women's Tour, distances that presumably you wouldn't have raced before back to back. Uh, yeah, so I did a couple of stage races this year. And um, I've definitely learned a lot from them. And I've learned that I get better day, day by day, um, which is quite, quite a good thing to build on. Um, but I think my first stage race, it was a Spanish one, quite a hilly one in Valencia in about May time. And uh, I really enjoyed that because it was long climbs and stuff. It's kind of my thing. It's like cobb cobbles and rain. I, did, I didn't envy all the girls at Roubaix. I watched it. I was like, oh, that's not a bit of me. But, um, that, that's a promising thing, though, isn't it, Tom? If a rider says, actually, day after day, I actually feel better. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of riders that don't say that. Yeah, and that's true, uh, especially someone of, of Alice's age, although I probably shouldn't keep mentioning her age. Um, yeah, it's really good to see. Women's Thor was, I think, 145k, three days running, which is yeah, it's a huge amount. Um, so, yeah, well, like I said, we're really proud of, of the progress that we've, everyone's made individually, but also collectively. So, um, yeah, I think Alice could be proud of her year. With the Paris-Roubaix coming in this year and the, the Tour de France next year for, for, for women as well, do you, how far along the line do you feel we are at the moment compared to where you want to be with it, the sport, this side of the sport? I, th I think it's really difficult the, um, from the outside because 
we look really professional, we act really professional. Got nice bags. Yeah, and we are quite far away. Um, it's getting nearer, and I think it's within within touching distance, and which almost makes it a little bit more frustrating because yeah, it's often what we think about on a weekly walk. Well, certainly, from in terms of my role and how we look at the future, it's really important for me that um, we can be the first British World Tour team, and I think that will mean a lot um, to a lot of people. Um, but we also don't want to just be there. So when you look at the men's side, there's, there's probably three divisions within the World Tour in terms of levels. Um, and we don't want to just have a license. We want to create... We're, like we're thinking, what does a modern World Tour team look like? So whether it's a development team, so things that Alice has experienced this year don't need, necessarily need to happen, but there's a, uh, maybe a, a better way around that or the whole pathway from juniors or community-focused or diversity, all of these things. I think um, well, we're, we're thinking about it, and it's um, quite exciting. Really, we've got, we've got a, almost a blank sheet of paper to to, to try and, and and go for that. But things like the the Tour de France, we can have meetings, and we just say, look, do you want to win the Tour de France with us? Like normal marketing people understand that, and it's, it, it's, it makes my my job a lot easier in terms of getting the door open. It's, it's something that's quite tangible um, rather than trying to explain the convoluted 12 month what is cycling. And cycling is really unique, not, not a lot of people get it. Um, so having that door opener of the Tour de France yeah, will be huge. Alice, do you feel you're part of something that is building and continuing to build? And, and if so, what, do you, what would be the uh, success for you next year? At this stage of your career, do you feel? What, what have you, what's in your mind for next year? Well, it's definitely an inspiring team to be a part of. I'd look back like when it was drops, the drops team a couple years ago, like the, the older like cohort, and I've always like, looked up to the team and thought, oh, I'd love to be part of that one day, and like, here I am kind of thing. And I'd love to you know, be part of the team's vision for the next couple of years. I've signed until the end of 2023, so... Um, yeah, I really do like have my trust in the team, and I'm really like uh, pleased that the team have got the trust in me. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to what can happen and and how things are gonna develop. Not only like team-wise, but technology with the ribble bikes and the and I think like yeah, it's gonna be really exciting in the next two years. A lot's changed in the last two, so what can happen in the next? Absolutely. And what and what about you, Mo? I mean, you've had some. Some very strong results. I think it was three top tens in the, in the women's tour. You had the 13th place in, in Paris-Roubaix with your bad leg. Um, next year, moving forward, what, what are you thinking? Another crack at Paris-Roubaix? Is that very high on your, on your list? Oh, yeah, that's going to be high on my list for a long time, I think. But, um, yeah, like for me personally, it's going to be chasing that UCI win. Um, I think that's, that's something that I think is realistic and, and, and we're going to be chasing as a team anyway. Um, with, with multiple riders, but um, yeah, I think the main thing with this team is that it's just the commitment from the riders and the staff, and like the, the yeah the sponsors around it. Like if you see how much they put in to making this team better, and like how many hours and how many um, yeah it, how how they work together is is really impressive for me to see. I've I've been in a few teams that I've never seen this uh, this kind of work uh, put together like this. So. That's something that really impressed me from the beginning on, and it's you see that it's going somewhere and it keep, keeps going. And, and I'm and really significant interested. that that sort of level of investment in time yeah, as well as money yeah. is, is, is geared towards the women's team, not specifically as well. Yeah, and that's that's something that when I got into like uh, elite cycling when I turned 18, uh, and I compare it to what Alice is going in right now, it's such a big difference over the few years that that's seven years ago. And if you look what happened now it's a totally different ballgame. And that, I think that's a really important thing to think about, like how far we've come in the past few years and where we can go. And I think this team really yeah, shows that. Mylene, thank you. We wish you every success. And to you, Alice, as well. And Tom, have a great season next season. Jamie, thanks for bringing the shiny new bikes along. It's been great to see you. Uh, 
Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, there's a bit more coming up in a few minutes' time. We've got a big finale with uh, Andrea Taffi and uh, Fabian Cancellara with uh, Matt Stevens. So big finish too today, so do stay with us if you can. But for now, can you put your hands together to our guests <laughs> from Drops for Call and from Ribble Bikes. Thank you very much. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank you.